Okay, we're live. All right, thank you. Um, my name is Emily Lesak, and I'm the Senior Research Community Officer on the Wikimedia Foundation Research Team. I'd like to welcome you to this month's research showcase. Our showcases are monthly convenings organized by our team to recognize and share recent research on or relevant to the Wikimedia projects. For those of you who are joining live, we welcome you to ask questions in the YouTube chat or on IRC. My colleague Pablo will monitor these channels and pass questions to the speakers at the ends of their presentations. And we kindly ask that attendees follow the friendly space policy and the universal code of conduct. Uh, before we begin, we do have a community announcement to share. That registration is now open for the 10th edition of Wiki Workshop, which will be held as a standalone virtual event on May 11th. And I'll drop the link to register in the YouTube chat. And with that, I'll pass it over to Miriam, who will introduce this month's theme and speakers. Thank you, Amelie. I have a very quick introduction for you. So I'm going to share the screen. And I'm assuming, unless I Anyone tells me anything else that you can see this. Um, all right. Um, hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the April 2023 Wikimedia Research Showcase. My name is Miriam. I'm part of the uh, Wikimedia Foundation research team. And I'm honored to be the host today. Um, today is going to be a very special and very visual um, showcase. We are because we're going to talk about the role of images on Wikipedia. So let me just give you a little bit of context of what we're going to see today. When we talk about images and Wikipedia, we talk about a beautiful place on the web called Wikimedia Commons. Wikimedia Commons is Wikipedia sister project operated by the foundation. And it's one of the largest repositories of free visual knowledge on the web. Just to give you a few numbers, um, the community of Wikimedia Commons is uh, quite big today. There are more than 15,000 active editors, some of which are very amazing. And they're starting creating artwork with the Wikimedia Commons logo using the latest AI image generation technologies, as you can see in this slide. Um, the result of the work of this community is quite astonishing. Commons today hosts more than 90 million multimedia files, audio, video, but mostly images. And it has been in steady growth in the past few years with the volume of content on Commons growing by 400% since 2014. And Wikimedia Commons is really the essential infrastructure of free visual knowledge because the large majority of images on Wikipedia are actually hosted on Commons with 17 million files used to illustrate articles in many, many languages. And so Wikimedia Commons and Wikipedia, they are really work together to create um, the free knowledge ecosystem that we see every day um, on our sites. And, um, Wikimedia Commons is important for Wikipedia because it actually enriches the encyclopedia. For example, just to give you an example, um, articles on Wikipedia that are illustrated, they're generally more popular. Illustrated Wikipedia pages get on average four times more views than um, articles without images. And note that this is not a causal relationship. It's not because they have an image that they are more popular, but this gives an, as, as an idea as the exposure that images get once they, once they enter the Wikipedia ecosystem. And Commons is important for Wikipedia also because readers like images a lot. Um, and this is a topic of the first presentation, so I'm not going to spoil any numbers. I'm just going to tell you that uh, readers engage with images very much and much more than other parts of the page. And then Daniele is going to uh, tell us more about his study on uh, how readers interact with images on Wikipedia. And while images are important for Wikipedia, we are still missing many, many images on the encyclopedia because there exists this large visual knowledge gap. On average, on a Wikipedia uh, project, there are 40% of articles that do not have an image. And if we break down this number by um, actual uh, Wiki, Wikipedia project, we see that the largest encyclopedias, such as English or German, for example, they have more than half of the articles that do not have an image. 
And while this visual gap is um, a problem in itself in terms of accessibility and the type of consumption of knowledge in different parts of the wikis, um, it can actually have repercussion on existing inequalities in the projects, such as, for example, the gender gap. We know from research that uh, it is important to have images of underrepresented genders in knowledge ecosystem in order to bridge the gender gap in society. And so it is important for us to understand the state of the visual gender gap in Wikimedia projects. And Pablo, in the second talk, is going to give us an overview of what is the visual gender gap in the 10 most spoken languages on Wikipedia. And with that, I am super excited to welcome today's speakers. Um, we have Daniele from University of Turin, who is going to give us the first talk about um, how readers interact with images on Wikipedia. And we, can, we have Pablo from Catholic University of Chile that is going to tell us about the visual gender biases on Wikipedia across different languages. I am also very excited that the room uh, on Zoom is very crowded today with many people who are interested um, in uh, this topic. We have uh, almost everyone from the Wikimedia Foundation research team. We have uh, friends from uh, and colleagues from Wikimedia staff. We have Fiona and Giovanna from the Glam and Culture team and uh, Jasmine, who is the product manager for um, a product that have been um, working on bridging the visual gap. We also have some collaborators of our speakers. We have Tiziana from Stanford University, who's been collaborating with our first speaker, Daniele, and Pushka from Cognizant, who has been working with Pablo. And with that, I hope I can go to the next slide. It doesn't work. Okay, the next slide was just about enjoy the... Um, showcase. I'm sorry, this is not working. Yes, here it is. So, um, I hope you enjoyed the showcase today. And with that, I can call Daniele on stage for the first talk. Thank you. Yep. Okay. I hope you see my slides. Okay, just stop me. Um, hi, everyone. Thank Not yet. you, Miriam, for the very kind. Not yet. Yes, now yes. Okay. So, uh, hi everyone. My name is Daniele Rama. I'm a postdoc at the University of Turin in Italy. Thank you very much, Miriam, for the kind introduction. And thank you for inviting me here today to present um, our project, which is about uh, a large scale study of reader interactions with, with images on Wikipedia. Media. Uh, this work has been done in collaboration on the Wikimedia Foundation and Rossano Schifanella, who is actually my um, PhD supervisor, uh, professor at the University of uh, Turin. So today we are going to talk about the visual side of Wikipedia. Uh, in the last 20 years, the volume of images and in general multimedia content has exploded online, uh, most of all thanks to uh, social media and uh, image sharing platforms. And the reason uh, is mainly because images facilit facilitates communication among people from different cultures and speaking different languages. So images are really changing the way people communicate and uh, share and use information online. Also in the, in the scientific literature, there is uh, evidence from uh, uh, psychological research that uh, images uh, and visual content play a key role in text comprehension, reading, uh, and learning. But uh, so far, little is known about uh, how images support knowledge sharing and learning and information seeking in online context. In Online context, uh, Wikipedia is actually the largest online resource for knowledge sharing. Wikipedia is made not only of textual content, but also on visual content. Uh, Wikipedia has more than 50 million articles and 40 million images spread across 3, 000, more than 3,000 languages. 
However, so far only a small fraction of the articles as Miriam was outlining before are illustrated. For example, in the English Wikipedia, only around 50% of the articles uh, have at least one image. And this, is, this percentage uh, decreases uh, a lot in the others uh, uh, language editions. And also little research has been done uh, trying to understand how images uh, impact uh, the readers uh, on Wikipedia. And that's uh, why we need to investigate uh, uh, the visual knowledge gaps uh, in the context of Wikipedia. So our main research question is, uh, uh, what we want to do in this project is trying to quantify and characterize readers' interaction with images on Wikipedia. In practice, we would like to answer to these three research questions. First of all, we would like to measure interactions and uh, measure to what extent readers interact with images. Then we would like to understand what are the factors associated with the engagement with interest uh, uh, with respect to images when reading articles. And uh, in conclusion, we would like to understand if images satisfy somehow readers, the reader's information need when navigating Wikipedia. The data we use in this project is a large scale uh, collection of uh, data coming from um, articles and images uh, of the English Wikipedia. Uh, we also collected all uh, the image related readers interactions that happened during uh, the month of the image collection, which is March, 2021. We collected page views, clicks on images and image previews, we will, which we will uh, see later both from desktop and mobile. And we uh, only use anonymized version of this data for uh, privacy reasons. Now that, now that we see uh, what data we were going to use, uh, the first research question is to what extent are readers interacting with images on Wikipedia? First of all, we need to uh, quantify interactions and find a way to measure engagement with images. Uh, to do so, we uh, define the click-through rate. The click-through rate is usually defined as the ratio between clicks and impressions. In this case, we measure the global click-through rate with respect to images, which in our case is defined as the ratio between page views uh, that uh, add at least one click on any image over the total number of page views that happened in the period of our data collection. And uh, uh, from a certain point of view, this is kind of the probability of observing an interaction with at least one image, given a random page view. It, uh, it can be interpreted like so. Let me give you uh, an example. This is, for example, a reader uh, reading a random page. Uh, there are images spread uh, uh, all over the text. And uh, let's suppose the reader wants to interact uh, with the image. The reader can click on that image. And then the image uh, uh, shows up in a new, in a different window called the media viewer. We collected all these kind of interactions and measured that the click to rate is 2.7%. Or in other words, uh, one in every 30 page views results in a click uh, of an image, which uh, may seem a very small uh, fraction of uh, page views, uh, but, but it's uh, actually, a, uh, for example, 10% higher than engagement with the other kind of interactive content of the pages, uh, for example, with uh, citations. So images, uh, uh, elicit a good amount of interaction actually on Wikipedia. Now that we have seen that uh, images are actually engaging, we move on and uh, ask ourselves what are the characteristics of the images that make image that uh, makes them interesting for readers uh, when navigating articles. To do so, we extracted a set of features. Uh, coming from the visual 
context and the visual content of the images. The visual context of the images are uh, basically the pages where the images are. And uh, uh, those uh, features are the topics of the page, the page length, the popularity of the page, the readability of the page. Also, we extract the length of the caption, if present, for any image, and the, the placement of the image, which can be the offset, meaning uh, how far from the top of the page the image is, and uh, if the image is placed within the info box, in line in the text, or in a gallery. The visual content, the features uh, coming from the visual content of the page are extracted, uh, taking inspiration from uh, scientific literature and are the quality of the image, the number of faces and the presence of uh, outdoor settings, which are three features that are usually associated with high level of engagement. Using these uh, features, we want to uh, we wanted to train our logistic regression uh, using the image specific click through rate as the target variable. So, in this case, we computed the click through rate for each image defined as the number of times an image was clicked uh, divided by the number of times an image was displayed, so appeared to the, to the reader. We uh, binarized the image click through rate, uh, splitting into uh, each value into high and low uh, according to the median of all the of the complete distribution and uh, also before running the logistic regression we uh, extracted a matched data set uh, in which uh, uh, we balance the page length and popularity of the between the two classes of high and low uh, image click to rate because from previous studies we know that uh, Page length and popularity are two um, features that have a um, high impact on the, in general, on the click to rate. After extracting these two balanced data set, we uh, train the logistic regression using the finalized image click to rate as uh, the target and the features uh, um, uh, and the image characteristics as, as features in the model. We actually uh, trained two logistic regressions. The first one was uh, trained on the topics of the page. And what we see is that uh, um, the topics that are uh, associated with a positive impact on the click to rate, meaning that in those topics, uh, uh, images are more likely to be clicked, are transportation, visual arts, and geography. On the other hand, uh, the topics where um, images are less likely to be clicked are entertainment, sports, and education. On the logistic regression, we uh, used all the remaining features, and we saw that uh, the outdoor, outdoor feature was the feature most uh, uh, positively associated with the uh, click on images. Uh, which uh, somehow is uh, um, in accordance with the, the fact that also on the other side uh, there are geography and transportation as main uh, um, positively associated uh, features. And uh, on the other hand, the offset is the most negatively associated feature with, um, with the click to rate, meaning that uh, the lower the image is on the page, the less likely it is to be clicked. We also note in this case that the presence, the presence of faces are, is negatively associated with the click to rate, even though we know from uh, previous literature that usually the presence of faces are instead positively associated. Um, I mean, uh, the presence of faces show high engagement uh, with images. And this is something that we will uh, dig deeper uh, later. We also uh, performed a cluster analysis, trying to identify groups of images with homogeneous characteristics using the features that I described before. Um, we identified 23 clusters. 
these are only uh, some examples each of each uh, uh, facet displays the um, mean value of each feature for uh, uh, each uh, a, a group of uh, images and for example the groups that are identified with high values of click, of click to rate are groups of uh, images uh, coming from uh, visual arts geography uh, biological topics transportation and also um, um, unpopular biographies on the other side uh, images associated with low click to rate are um, biographies of sports people and also popular biographies. We here start to see that uh, the presence of faces uh, has been uh, disentangled by this analysis, showing that uh, uh, faces are so, um, sometimes associated with high click rate when they are um, showing uh, unpopular biographies, but on the other side uh, are associated with low level of click rate uh, in the case of uh, popular biographies. We want to investigate more on this aspect uh, and uh, um, perform a matched uh, analysis, the, dividing images into two groups, uh, images with faces and images without faces. This uh, plot shows the uh, click to rate as a function of uh, the popularity of the page. And we see that up to a certain point, images are more likely to be clicked when showing faces. Uh, um, so when pages are uh, um, not so popular, images are more likely to be clicked when they show uh, faces. And it, it, it appears to be the opposite in the case of uh, highly popular. Uh, pages. So uh, our hypothesis is that uh, probably people tend to click more on faces, uh, on images with faces, only when they don't know the person of the people they are looking to. Finally, our last research question is, uh, uh, do images satisfy readers' information need when navigating Wikipedia? Here we explore um, data about a different kind of uh, uh, interaction, which are page previews. Page pre previews are uh, little pop-ups -up, pop that shows up when uh, uh, the mouse goes over a, a link within a page. And uh, in this case, uh, a little box opens, which so shows a, a short preview, a short uh, textual summary of the destination page. And the preview can have or uh, could have or could not have an image um, complementing the text. For each preview, we computed the conversion rate, which in this case is defined as the uh, ratio between the previews followed by a page view. So page previews where the, use, the readers actually click on the destination page over the total number of previews displayed. We compare the conversion rate for the two, group of, two groups of um, previews, the one with, uh, without images and the one with images. And we see that uh, across all the level of popularities, the conversion rate is higher for previews without images. So it is more likely to visualize uh, the next page if it has no image in the preview. Again, here our interpretation is that uh, probably images tend to have a, tend to play a um, information, um, support, tend to be at an information support for, uh, I mean, uh, a support for textual information. So when readers uh, see also the image, they are less likely to click and go on and explore the next, uh, the next topic. Let me summarize uh, the main takeaways of our research. Uh, so first of all, we have seen that uh, 
images tend to have uh, quite a high level of engagement, uh, at least 10% with respect to other type of interactive content on pages, such as references. We also see that the clicks on images occur uh, less often in longer and popular articles uh, and when images are placed at the bottom of a page. Um, with respect to topics, uh, images are more likely to be clicked uh, in pages of visual arts, transportation, and geography. And also faces are engaging, but on Wikipedia only when showing less popular people. Also, finally, images help to satisfy the reader's information needs uh, when navigating Wikipedia. Uh, our results uh, can help uh, editors uh, to include visual content uh, in areas or of articles where uh, uh, that we think are more engaging for readers. Also, from our results, uh, other researchers uh, can start uh, building uh, models that to find the, the right images uh, uh, to be recommended to Wikipedia articles. And also uh, our results somehow provide a justification for investments and initiatives designed to improve the uh, visual side of uh, Wikipedia, such as Wikipedia Loves Monument and Wikilove Science. Thank you all for listening and thank you again to my collaborators, Tiziano, Miriam and uh, Rosano. Okay, thank you very much, Daniele, for the presentation today. Uh, we have some comments on the YouTube chat, like people are saying like the cluster you have presented was very interesting. I don't know if we have questions here in the room to Daniele. I have several, but let's space to others to start the discussion. Okay, if not, I can initiate the discussion with one question. So in, well, it's, it's like classic in research. So cases like we typically ask speakers, uh, like this is our work that focuses on English Wikipedia. So we typically ask the speakers how much their results are expected to differ if they extend their work. Ah, thank you. I didn't saw that Leila has a hand up. Uh, Leila, go first, please. No, I think you're asking part of my question. Go ahead. Ah, okay. Yeah, I, for some reason, I cannot see reaction. I think I have a problem with the Zoom version. So please, if you have questions, please tell me in the chat. Yeah, I, I was going to add, like, we typically ask what how much the results will differ. We go for other languages. But in this particular occasion, I, I'm more curious by studying this work of analyzing the same image on different language versions of Wikipedia, and maybe not in the same page or not in the same context, and how the results are affected by the Feature from the image or feature from the community, the specific uh, community in the, on that level. Uh, thank you for the question, Pablo. Um, actually, uh, now I don't, I don't have many expectations on what the results could be extended this uh, work on other uh, language editions. Actually, um, also because I don't know how many images, I mean, it would be interesting to know first how many images are uh, present in, I don't know, uh, a good number of language editions. Like, I don't know, the most, the 10 most popular. Uh, because I don't know uh, which is the, per how they are spread across uh, different editions. Uh, what we started to see uh, some time ago uh, was to try to understand how the results of the logistic regression generalize across countries in the world, which is a bit uh, uh, tricky to um, interpret because uh, you know um, there is uh, very very different levels of uh, 
uh, I mean, there are different levels of volumes of people coming to Wikipedia from one country to another. It's difficult to compare, I don't know, people coming to the English Wikipedia, which is, uh, you know, billions of people and people coming to, I don't know, uh, some wiki, some version in some particular country in Africa, because there are, there could be way less, uh, the popularity could be way less and also gener uh, results could generalize, uh, uh, could not generalize and we can introduce uh, biases. But yeah, that would be for sure something that we will, would like to investigate more. Thank you, Andrea. You have a question? Leila. Yeah, thank you so much, Daniela, also Rosano, Tiziano, and Miriam for this research. Um, my question is to build up on what Pablo asked. I think, uh, as you know, we, we, we have a concern about like the different languages of Wikipedia. And particularly in the case of English, we know from older data from 2017, 18, 19 time period that around 75% of the page views are by men. Now, we also know that there are topical, some, we have some indications of topical preferences between what men or women read on Wikipedia. And when you shared the statistics about um, topics in which images were uh, clicked uh, more often, um, I naturally thought about this issue that um, there, there can be correlation between basically the number of page views that is received by one gender and then like what happens with the topics and then with the data that you see here. So one uh, suggestion I had is that for future research, you all consider including an, in a language in which uh, one or two languages in which we have a smaller gap in terms of separation or a smaller gender gap basically in readership. Um, there are languages like Polish or Romanian where the gap is smaller. Of course, you have to answer the question of whether you have sufficient images and all that. So I appreciate that. But I think it's important to consider that because let's say if you go to the case of Romanian, you will end up with roughly 60% of the page views being by men, which is significantly lower than, than English. And you may be able to see results that can be different or not, right? We will learn something uh, on, on that front. I don't know if you have any reactions to it, Daniele, or others uh, who are on the uh, paper and research. Uh, yeah, that's a very, very interesting comment. Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, that may uh, explain also, I mean, at least partially why we see military, for example, as uh, the four uh, most positive uh, um, coefficient for the logistic regression, assuming that military topics are uh, mostly associated with the uh, main readership. So yeah, for sure the approach you suggested would be very, very uh, useful in our case. Yeah, I mean, the military topic was something that appeared a lot in our, uh, in all the analysis we did, also uh, analysis that we are currently running. So that may be yeah, one of the reasons for sure. Thank you, Leila, for the question and for the answer. We have time for one more question. I think Giovanna has a question too. Yes, uh, thank you. So I was wondering, uh, because you said that uh, the articles that you have more clicks uh, in images are the ones about transportation, visual arts, and geography, uh, as the slide that you, the slide that you are showing, and the ones that has that have less uh, clicks are the ones about entertainment in sports and education. And as as far as I understand, um, entertainment and sports are articles that are very popular. So it's like the opposite, right? And so I was wondering, I know that you, ha you have the hypothesis that um, maybe people click less because 
um, especially in tournaments that, you know, popular articles have, you know, they are about people who are more known, so their faces are more known as well. But I was wondering if it, it's also like a, about the details that are depicted in the image, because you know transportation, visual art, geography. I I tend to think when I think about images about those subjects, I think about images that have a lot of details and that I would like to see up close and you know to visualize it in a bigger way, especially geography with maps. So I was wondering if this is something that you are thinking about as well. This is uh, something that appeared somehow. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you for the, the question, Giovanna. And uh, yeah, uh, it would be for sure interesting to somehow define uh, kind of image complexity somehow and see how people tend to engage with respect to this uh, uh, to this aspect uh, we we didn't we didn't think about it when we uh, performed this kind of analysis we only you uh, we computed a feature which is image quality but it's kind of a different thing uh, which is this quality is related to uh, the quality, the image quality category in uh, commons. Uh, um, yeah, but apart from that, we didn't explore in details uh, the details of the images. I mean, we didn't uh, look further into the content of the images apart from the uh, three features that we extracted, which are the quality, faces, and um, outdoor set settings. Uh, but yeah, that would be interesting to, to investigate. Um, Giovanna, thank you for this question. This is a, a topic that um, has been actually investigated bo both by the um, cognitive psychology uh, researchers um, and experimental psychology researchers who wanted to understand the relation between visual complexity and the interestingness of the image. And then these kind of studies have been translated to a computational approach by computer vision researchers trying to measure complexity and its relation with visual interesting on a large scale. So what happens, so the result of this research show that there is a inverted U shape relationship between visual interestingness and complexity. And so that means that up to some point, uh, there is a um, like upward relation between interestingness and complexity, and then it goes down when the image is too complex. So actually there is much more study to do to understand whether it's the complexity of the image that actually arise interestingness and what is the component of like making the image bigger versus um, actually the image is interesting for, for the, um, the reader. So a previous research from experimental psychology would tell us that there is actually an interestingness component, but it would be interesting to decouple those two. Um, so thank you for, for raising this. This is, this, is, this is very interesting, at least for people like me who've been studying some of these things for years. So thank you so much. Thank you, Miriam. Uh, there is just one clarifying question on IRC. Uh, Andrew wants to know if the geographical location of the user was considered as a variable in this research. Uh, sorry, were considered as? As a, as a variable in the research, in the analysis. If you were considering the geographical location of the user. Uh, we didn't consider the geographical location in this analysis, in this, uh, in this paper. We started to investigate also the geographical, I mean, uh, location of the users. But again, it was uh, a bit difficult to, as I uh, was saying before, it was a bit different to interpret the results uh, for people coming from very different uh, areas because uh, there could be uh, several bias, also con connectivity issues, uh, 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 availability of uh, 
uh, information communication technologies to different uh, 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 kind of kind of people around the world. So we at, at the end we didn't consider the geographical aspect of the leadership. I mean. Please thank you, Daniela. Okay, so I think it's time to oh, so thank you again, Daniela, for your presentation and to uh, go with Paolo's talk. Thank you. Should I introduce Pablo? I'm going to introduce Pablo. <laughs> um, Pablo, uh, Daniela, if you can stop sharing your screen so Pablo can share his screen. Uh, all right, Pablo Beitia from Catholic University of Chile is going to tell us about visual gender biases on Wikipedia. Pablo, please, the floor is yours. Um, okay, thank you very much, Miriam, for, for this introduction. The Wikimedia Research Team for, for the kind invitation. I'm very happy to be here um, and present this study representing a fantastic team composed of Pushkal, Agarval, Miriam Reddy, and Videk Singh. Let me talk a little about the context um, of this investigation. For some time, we have known that Wikipedia tends to register and communicate content disparities in multiple dimensions like gender, geography, culture, historical period, and so on. Uh, a particularly well-known fact is the low percentage of articles on women, usually less than 20% in different versions. Some studies uh, found that the gender gap in content is more complex than that. We have multiple asymmetries in the text, for example, um, the lexicon, topics, sources, or network centrality. This is relevant to Wikipedia users and volunteers, and several initiatives have emerged attempt, uh, attempting to balance the content between genders. However, there is little research, um, sorry, a few interesting studies have addressed gender bias as a joint manifestation of multiple biases. However, there is little research on the visual aspect of the content gender gap. That is how images are used to depict genders in Wikipedia. The goal of this study was to evaluate the content gender gap with an integral approach. We tried to analyze visual and non-visual disparities in content from a comprehensive and systematic perspective. Uh, but what does it mean? First, we wanted to consider biographical diversity. We know from previous studies that the content biases in Wikipedia are different for each language version, and also for biographical domains. For example, articles about people with the same occupation. So we assume that the bias evaluation should consider this content diversity. Our second intuition was that a proper bias evaluation needs to expand the types of content analysis. On the one hand, we need a multimodal approach considering written and visual content. On the other hand, it is relevant to observe the biases generated in multiple stages of content production. Here, I need to explain more about what involves this multi-stage perspective. Think of Wikipedia as a continuous cycle of knowledge organization. So in this cycle, we can recognize some big editing stages. We identify three, the selection of the topic, uh, topics for articles, the building of the content, and the positioning of the edited articles within the information system. Each stage, is linked to um, more specific editing processes and a way of framing communication. And we can connect most of the content asymmetries with these three stages of content production. The selection stage is the beginning of the editing cycle in Wikipedia. One editor proposes an article to edit 
for example, a specific biography, and editors with experience can accept or reject the proposal. Regarding communication, the representation of social groups in Wikipedia is a stake in this selection stage. The literature on gender gaps has studied in this dimension the article coverage of each gender and the deletion processes. The second stage of content production is the building of articles. This is the moment when editors create biographies adding writing and visual content. Also here, we have the discussion processes as a background of the generated articles. In terms of framing, in this stage, Wikipedia creates collective, a collective characterization of each gender or social category. Some gender asymmetries related to this stage include writing length, lexical, topical, and source biases. The final stage in this cycle is the positioning of content related to processes like content classification, the connection between articles through hyperlinks, and the multilingual dissemination of content in Wikipedia. These processes frame communication by giving a structural placement to social categories, that is, ordering them into positions with better or worse probabilities to get communicated. In the gender gaps literature, positioning has been studied by analyzing variables like classification structure, network position, and multilingual notability. So in this study, we understood the content gender gap in Wikipedia in this complex way, um, considering the multiple stage of content production. Um, in this model, the content gender gap is a composite phenomenon, an integral result that comprises as cooperating content layers, all these gaps and their mutual relations. Now we're back to the question, um, in what sense did we offer a systematic approach? We can clearly respond to this by comparing our perspective with previous studies. In most cases, uh, research on visual gender biases in Wikipedia has focused on one language version, English or German. Uh, and they analyzed that in a sample of biographies, the building stage with one metric, the number of images. By contrast, we designed a multilingual research in the 10 most spoken languages, considering all biographies and exploring the three editing stage with a multimodal approach. How we de did it? We started compiling the complete list of biographies from WeData in any language with the gender, occupation, and birthplace. Then we classify the biographies into gender categories and 10 occupational domains. The quality of the article was calculated with an automatic classifier based on the structure of the article. We then collected all the images of the biographies in the 10 selected languages and estimated the visual quality by training an image quality classifier contrast, contrasting with media commons and higher quality images. The next step was to calculate eight metrics of content asymmetries, representing the three stages of content production in a multimodal way. Each metric is a content ratio between female and male biographies. We created similar indicators in textual and visual content to compare both communication modalities as much as possible. In the selection stage, we calculated the ratio of female uh, versus male biographies. To have a similar visual indicator, we selected only the article with images and calculated the same ratio. In the building stage, we estimated the text quantity by comparing the average number of, of characters in biographies. As a visual counterpart, we compared the average number of images in female and male biographies. 
Regarding building quality, we estimated ratios of article quality within, between female and male biographies. We also compare between both genders, the average image quality. As an indicator of content positioning, we compare the average number of languages in which each gender had, has its biographies. And to set a comparable visual indicator, we selected only articles with images and calculated the same ratio between female and male biographies. So what were our main results? All our metrics are ratios contrasting female and male content. So if these ratios are close to one, there is no content bias. When the metrics are over one, there is a female bias. And when they are under one, there is a male bias. We also distinguish with colors the metrics related to visual, um, to visual bias from the indicator related to the text or general content. Our main results are related to multilingual analysis. You can see that the most salient male biases, both written and visual, appear in the article selection stage, when editors decide uh, which personalities should have a biography. Um, Russian, Arabic, and French are the languages with more male bias in the selection of biographies. The situation is different in the building stage. Women tend to have more text in biographies, but there is a contrasting visual trend, a male bias in the number of images. Regarding content quality, women have better articles and images with better quality. And in the positioning stage, Female biographies have better multilingual coverage in some languages, like Russian and Arabic, but that is not a general rule. We also have languages like Indonesian and Chinese, where female biographies average a lower multilingual coverage. So to sum up, the most salient male biases, both written and visual, appear when editors select which personalities should have a Wikipedia page. The trends in written and visual content are dissimilar. So we cannot assume the same pattern in both modalities, especially in the building stage. Male biographies tend to have more images across languages and female biographies have better visual quality on average. So, how can we use this data to fight against gender biases? Or what are the practical implications uh, for edi editors trying to balance the content? To use um, our data in the best possible way, you can see this challenge like a battleship board. Um, in this old game, players attempt to sing rival chiefs by, by sending ballots into specific cells. So you can alter our gender indicators in a similar matrix according to two variables, Wikipedia language version and occupational domains. For example, this is the matrix for image quantity ratios. In our data, we have 10 languages and 10 occupational domains. There is a female bias where we see green cell, uh, a green cell in this matrix. For instance, in Indy, notable women have more images than men when they have religious or army occupations. On the contrary, where the cell is brown, there is a trend toward a male bias. This matrix summarize 100 content ratios in one specific metric, the image quantity. But we studied eight of them. So you can observe the big picture in a multimodal and multi-stage perspective that involves 800 content patterns. 
This is how you can see the content gender gap from a multimodal and multi-stage perspective. Each board is related to one metric. Certainly, I, I cannot summarize now the, the main pattern, but I think we via editors can use these multiple boards to search gender biases in their own language community and locate them in specific occupational domains. Um, and finally, from a cultural point of view, we can also use this data to reflect on what Wikipedia versions have similar composition in their gender biases. For each language, we have 80 gender metrics, a ratios by 10 occupational domains. So in future studies, we can estimate the proximity of languages specifically re regarding the gender bias production. This is an example um, with a jerarchical clustering modeling, we can represent the language version's proximity and display the, display the results in a, in a tree diagram. So you can see in this model that the Western Europe languages, English, French, Portuguese, and Spanish, are too close regarding the, their gender biases uh, structures. Um, Russian appears like a bridge to a second cluster between Arabic and Chinese, um, and the widely spoken languages around India have also um, a relative closeness. So that's all. Thank you very much for watching this presentation. Thanks to you, Pablo. This was a very, very interesting uh, talk and an impressive work that you all have, have conducted. So the, we have some comments on YouTube, so I will start uh, with them. There is a participant who is curious about models to find out which, uh, which images are needed, in particular, what kind of images. So, for example, in an article about uh, airplanes, uh, his, uh, that person is interested in whether like, uh, there will be need to images about the type of uh, airplanes or more details about parts of the airplanes like cabin or more about the social content like the airfield logo. So uh, I think this goes to how to uh, make those fundings actionable in the, in, in the space of recommended system and how we can learn about those biases to, to be filled in Wikipedia. So the, um, what is a specific question? How we can learn about airplanes, for, for example, in Wikipedia? No, in, it's, it's more, yeah, this is an example. Like the main purpose is how to discover uh, images that might be needed. And this ah, is okay. how what you were presenting in the end. Yes, yes, yes. Um, at the end of the presentation, I, I was showing some, some, some matrix um, related to um, our de database, yeah. So we have an open database with this information, and you can uh, create this matrix. Uh, we extract information, um, for example, on the languages, the biographies, of course, the gender, the occupation, and also the 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 birth uh, place. So, so you can select, uh, if you are interested, for example, in Spanish Wikipedia and you are, you are um, editing Spanish Wikipedia, you can, you can create the matrix um, and see if in Spanish Wikipedia we have a gender bias related to people that were born in uh, Latin America. Yeah, that is an example. Or you can see if in Spanish will be, uh, you can, um, there is a gender bias uh, related to um, re religious people. Um, so we don't have all the occupations um, or topics uh, that you can find in Wikipedia, but but we we have some some relevant information and and you can combat the 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 bias in that form. Thank you, Pablo. Also, 
uh, the participant on the YouTube chat of said your answer. That participant is always bringing another point that I think it relates to both presentations. Uh, uh, that participant uh, mentioned like maybe there are images that are ethically problematic or they reinforce the stereotypes or they affect mm -hmm. their personality rights. So in, in the context of biases, to what Pablo presented, but also in, in in the area of engagement, what Daniele presented. I don't know if you have uh, some thoughts about these uh, content, this visual content that might be problematic. We we didn't uh, do that kind of analysis. Yeah, and uh, we 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 started writing in a in a field with with few studies. So, so we try to offer a general picture of that. So the, the, the most general picture is related to the quantity of images, the quality of the images and so on. But we, we didn't um, analyze the stereotypes that I think need um, a most specific approach, uh, most dedicated. Yeah? For, for example, in sociology, you have the, the in studies of uh, from Irving Goffman analyzing this kind of stereotypes and 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 he used six uh, kind of stereotypes, but I think the computational approach that we use in this study uh, cannot cannot um, give that that kind of qualitative de details. So it's a challenge. It's a big challenge to have the methods to 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 give that kind of information with stereotypes, for example. It's Pablo. I think Miriam also has something to. Do. Yeah. No. I just wanted to um, um, give a perspective on the comment from uh, the, the uh, around having models that can suggest images to be added to articles. So, and, um, and actually Jasmine is, is here. So we've been working with a few of the product teams to um, develop models that can suggest images um, that uh, can be good matches for unillustrated articles. These models are, um, and yeah, Jasmine, I let you, I let you also uh, tell something if you want. Um, these models they are um, largely based on what is already existing on Wikipedia. So we are able to, for example, align articles across different languages or align sections across different languages, and say if this image is good for this section in language A, then it should be good in la for language B. Um, I think what is in so we don't have a very good way to prioritize what are the most important areas in the article where we need images, and I think this is where Daniela's study might be useful, as well as Pablo's matrices, where we say, okay, there are, there are missing images in these important aspects on on knowledge equity. Um, and the other thing is. Um, and I'm not answering the question from, from the audience, I'm just giving a, a generic perspective, is that we, because we use existing uh, patterns on Wikipedia, um, we, use, we use these existing images to avoid um, further potential biases, but at the same time, we are also replicating any bias that is already on Wikipedia. So there is a lot more work to do on the in these models. Um, and um, I don't know, Jasmine, if you want uh, to add anything else from a product perspective of how these things have been working and etc. Yeah. Yeah, you covered a lot of it, Marion. The only thing I would add is that looking to the future, uh, marrying things that uh, are putting together things like the topics API, uh, for example, or allowing some sort of like filtering uh, could perhaps take us a step in the right direction when it comes to these. But um, I think there's still like some more work to do uh, to be able to get to that place. But it is a direction, especially within the apps uh, and perhaps on like the other platforms that we're interested in.
thank you. Uh, Giovanni, I think you have something to, to comment, and then Leila. Yeah, I have a question about something else, actually, um, about the part about the building uh, part of the process, because there you said that uh, there are more images um, depicting men uh, and less and, and images that are higher quality uh, uh, that depicts women, right? And so that immediately made me think about the problem that not the problem but I mean this is the characteristic and what is good about our projects that the 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 images they need to be open access or in public domain right so that creates the problem of maybe um like the fact that those are old images you then have um more men depicted on it like this is the case in like in museums and galleries as well like that bias exists uh, especially as um, the older you get, right, in the in the in the collections, for example. So I was wondering if you uh, saw that represented somehow, and like for me, it would explain, I think, why higher quality images are from women because they are just more recent, I would assume. Um, and if you saw that, uh, if you think that there is a way for us to work on that. I know that there are several campaigns that I think kind of go into that direction, like Visible Wicked Women and whose knowledge and all of that. But I was wondering if you have some sort of perspective related to that. Um, I, I have the same hypothesis. So probably the, is the residency the, the, the key to understand this, yeah? Um, and, and also if you, if you see this, this, this kind of information in a historical point of view, um, yeah, the gaps are, are huge. So um, the beginning of the history you have maybe, and this is interesting, you have more female biographies, but then you have around, 25 centuries um, with, with few uh, biographies, female biographies. And maybe um, after um, 1950, around 1950, you have more women, famous women or notable women in the, in the record. So you, you have a, a huge historical um, um, ranch without female or with, with around 5% of notable women. So that, that is part of the program. In, in that re, uh, range, historical range, of course, the, the image quality is not the best. Um, but now in the last 50 years, you have better quality. So yeah, probably it's a good explanation. Thank you, Pablo. We have time for our last question, and I think Leila has raised her hand. Leila, we cannot hear you. Okay, like there are some big issues. Uh, okay, so I will pause some, I have this last question. So I think that the work that you all presented today is is, is super relevant in the space of, uh, of knowledge gaps. In my case, I'm focused on other area that the team is working in knowledge integrity. Um, I'm, I'm wondering like how, how, what can we learn from all this work on images uh, that can affect the integrity of knowledge. Like for instance, uh, some members uh, of the team that have presented today work on engagement. Uh, they also work on engagement and citations that apparently the engagement and citations is lower than the, uh, the one on images. So what can we learn from the images space to improve the area of citations? Or uh, also in, in, in the aspect of biases, like how can we 
learn from biases on, on images that we can improve, existing biases that might exist in terms of source reliability? I, I, this, is, this is a complex question. I, I do expect you to have a quick answer. And if not, we can continue in our channel this, this conversation um, and, and keep these ideas. So I think if there are no further questions, uh, let's wrap the, the session up, Emily. All right, thanks, Pablo. Uh, that was a really interesting session. Um, thank you so much to Daniela and Pablo for sharing your work with us today. We appreciate your accepting our invitation to be here. Uh, the showcase today was made possible thanks to coordinated efforts between myself, Pablo Aragon, as well as Diego. Um, we'd also like to thank Miriam for introducing today's topic and speakers, um, Pablo for handling the Q&A on YouTube and IRC. Um, big thanks to Emerald for providing the AV support, as well as Janet Renteria for coordinating internally. Um, and thanks to all of you who tuned in live or are watching the recording. There will be no showcase in May since we'll be hosting the 10th edition of Wiki Workshop. So this is another friendly reminder to please register in advance. Our next showcase will then be in June and it will focus on representation of non-binary and LGBT people on Wikipedia. So we hope to see you there. I'd also like to share that this unfortunately will be my last research showcase. I am leaving the foundation at the end of this week to pursue another opportunity. Um, but I would like to take a moment to thank all of the speakers that we featured over the last couple of years for taking the time to share your work with a broader community um, and also thank those of you who have watched the recordings and contributed to the discussions. Uh, so each month I just want to share that I'm really inspired by the featured research and its potential to have a positive impact on the broader community and highlight that the success of this showcase as well as the other initiatives is really doing a large part to all of your thoughtful contributions. Um, so if you are a member of the Wikimedia research community, and if you have any immediate questions or need support, we invite you to please reach out to Layla, the head of research, or you can join us at one of the upcoming research team office hours.